Welcome to the Damascus Road Podcast. On the road to Damascus, Paul had a radical encounter with Jesus and his life was changed forever. That is what we hope and pray for here. Now, on to this week's episode. Are any of you to-do list people? You have this large list and you slowly check items off as you go? I use an app called AnyDo that integrates my to-do list with my calendar, which is really helpful most of the time. But sometimes, instead of helping me, I become a little overwhelmed with the task that I need to get done. And then I start wishing and hoping that there's more than 24 hours in a day. How have you ever been in the same situation? Imagine what it would be like if we had just six more hours. Imagine what you could do in a 30 hour day. It seems like I'd have more time, not just for these tasks that I needed to get done, but for my wife, for my friends, for my kids all the books that I've wanted to read and never gotten to. I'm a failed English major, apparently. I don't read the classics. Imagine the number of Star Realms matches I could play from the comfort of my own toilet. I would be globally ranked. I could scale the highest mountain, swim the deepest ocean, and walk 1,000 miles. I could do anything. What would you do if you had a few extra hours in the day? Sleep more, maybe? Learn a new language or how to play a musical instrument? Eat second breakfast or 11Zs or fourth meal. Work out, I mean like not every day, but maybe like once a week or sometime. Um, find the lost city of Atlantis perhaps. Discover a new species of dinosaur and name it after yourself. Catch up on all 75 hours of the Marvel movies and TV shows. Then move on to all the non-MCU shows and films too, like uh, College Ryan's favorite Daredevil with Ben Affleck. And once you've done the Marvel binge, you can binge Mighty Ducks, Game Changers on Disney Plus, or Cobra Kai on Netflix, because nostalgia is all the rage. Or if you can master the right poses, you too could become a social media influencer. With just a few more hours a day, it seems like life would be different, doesn't it? But would the extra time actually solve our problem? The unfinished tasks, the unanswered emails, unread books, poor relationships that litter our lives. Or would we keep living exactly the same way we are now? Wouldn't work and tasks just expand to fill the time, as the saying goes? Maybe our problem isn't the amount of time, but what we're doing with it. The truth is, many of our lives are out of control and our lives become something we never meant them to be, unsustainable, unfulfilling, and underwhelming. Many of us don't have a clear purpose and focus to what we are doing, so the demands of life overwhelm us. And our enemy desires to keep us distracted from what is eternally valuable and neutralize our potential by keeping us so tired and ragged that we can hardly care for ourselves, let alone anyone else. Now, maybe you have the opposite problem. Because we lack purpose and focus, we fall into apathy and laziness. It's easier to do nothing and succeed at that than to try something and fail, especially if we don't know what we should do. So we choose distraction or self-medication or temporary pleasures instead of lasting joy. I don't know about you, but I want to live a life that matters. Not in a change in the world sort of way, but in a loving my family and friends well, in doing the unique things I'm designed to do, in learning to really love God and other people, in learning to rest in God's love in that sort of way. When I reach the end of my life, I hope my wife and kids and friends know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I loved them and I loved God. I want to live a life that is beautiful, And I believe following the example of Jesus and learning to live and love as he did will lead me to a life that's worth living, to a life that is truly life, as Paul wrote in 1 Timothy. And this sort of life doesn't just happen. We don't drift into a life worth living. It's in choosing small choices every day that will form our lives. One choice, one hour, one day, one week, one month, and one year at a time. When all of those days add together, I hope they will make a beautiful tapestry that is a well-lived life. But to live a life, to craft a life that's a masterpiece, 
We have to live one day at a time. We must actively choose who we want to be and how we spend our time with wisdom and courage. Or we will not only miss out on the most important parts of life, we'll fail to become who God made us to be. So what can we do? How can we make sure that we are crafting a life that's worth living? One thing that I believe that will help is to start structuring our time throughout our days in a way that will enable us to become who God has made us to be. We can't live thinking, I'll get to what matters most when life slows down, or if I can just make it to that magic moment, then things will be perfect. We must prioritize what matters in our lives every day. Here's one way to think about it. This picture is your life. It can only hold so much inside of it and our capacities are all different. Who knows how much time we all have, but no matter your capacity or the time, the container, your life is going to be filled with something. In this instance, it's filled with sand. Now the sand represents all the things you have to do in life. It's the work you have to get done, the tasks your boss gives you, the assignments your teacher so kindly lists on the syllabus. It's what must be done at the office or home or school and sand that fills your picture. Then there are the personal tasks we need to accomplish to survive, like sleep. Generally, we spend a third to a quarter of all the hours we live on Earth sleeping. I mean, I don't know anything that's much better than a good night's sleep. Maybe a few things, but not many. It's amazing how much a restful night helps me love others and how much lack of sleep can make me a shadow of who I should be. But it's not just sleep that's filling our container. It's the other things we have to do. It's brushing our teeth and flossing even. It's taking showers, it's shaving, you know, basic hygiene, which I really encourage you to do if you have not started. We wanna look good, so we spend a little bit of time in makeup or hair or clothes. Maybe you even visit the doctor or dentist occasionally. It's just more sand in the picture. What about household jobs? Most of us have to buy food, prepare it, clean up after it. Megan primarily likes preparing it, but both shopping for it and cleaning up later are much lower on her joy meter. I mostly just like eating it. But it all takes time, it's more sand in the picture. Maybe you have a house and yard maintenance, checkbooks to balance, laundry and vacuuming and computer problems to address, and the picture gets filled faster and faster. Maintaining relationships is important, from social obligations at work or school to family birthdays to kids' activities, and if you're a parent, it's amazing how much time your kids' activities will take. And I'm not even talking about nourishing the most important relationships, just doing the little to maintain the ones that you have. It's just more sand in the picture. Author and pastor John Ortberg tells us, you will, if you're average, spend seven minutes a day on plant and or pet care, and 16 minutes a day, roughly one year of your life, looking for lost objects. If your name happens to be Ryan Miller, you probably need to double that. Then there's car time. You will spend six months of your life at traffic lights. If you're average, you will spend 75 minutes a day commuting. We can make choices that push us higher or lower on the spectrum in these areas. I want to minimize my car and commute time, but that doesn't get me more minutes in my day. It's just a different way to structure my time. And of course, we need not forget recreation. We have to have something to do to unwind from all of our busyness. Our hobbies need to have some space too. Reading, sports, movies, hiking, Netflix, music, video games, live theater, concerts, travel. It's more sand in the container. And then the unexpected happens. The car breaks down. Aunt Irma stops by for a surprise visit. You or your spouse or your mom or kids get sick. And it fills up the pitcher fast. And at this point, the pitcher has probably overflowed. And I don't know about you, but just listening to this is making me feel a little overwhelmed. Experts in key fields like financial planning, family therapy, vocation coaching, physical training, and sleep research were asked how much time people need to devote to their area of expertise, just the bare minimum to get by. And when all the numbers were added together, it was 36 hours a day, not even 30, 36. Have you ever felt like you needed more hours in a day to get done just the bare essentials? That if you just had more time, you could get it all done and have time for what really matters. I know I felt like that. And if you look at the picture, our life is full. But what about the bigger things? The small tasks of life have overwhelmed everything that's more significant. And we miss that last conversation with our parent or grandfather. We miss the moments of wonder with our kids, the moments of romance with our significant other, the joy of friendship and the presence of God. 
how do we fit them in to a picture that's already full? Let's look at how Jesus spent his days and what he prioritized. Because if anyone got it right, I think he did. And Jesus gives us a simple answer of how we need to structure our time. He tells us what we should focus on is this. He says, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. So how do we do that in life? How do we structure our time around this idea? We focus on the four things that Jesus focused on. The first thing that we focus on is God, represented by this baseball with a G on it. A survey asked thousands of people what keeps them from knowing and loving God better. The number one answer is I'm too busy. And I don't want to get the end of my life and have that be my answer to why I didn't learn to enjoy God's presence, why I didn't talk to God throughout the day and read his written communication to people in the Bible. Ortberg comments, it's ironic that the early followers of Jesus could not be stopped by persecution, poverty, prison, or martyrdom, but we're stunted by something as trivial as too much to do. The primary thing we need to do to get to know God better is time and attention. It's not something that can be rushed. You can't skim God like your class assignment or that work email. To become more and more like Jesus, to grow and overcome our faults, to become more loving, peaceful, hopeful, and joyous, it takes time and attention in the presence of the Father. Even Jesus needed time with his Father. Jesus only describes eternal life once in the Gospels. This is what he says. This is eternal life, that they, his disciples, may know you, the only real God, and Jesus the anointed whom you have sent. The term know used biblically refers to a deep, intimate relationship, not mere head knowledge. And the good news is that this eternal kind of life can begin now. It continues by following Jesus every day and then moves into eternity. It's not for someday, it's for today. And over and over again in his ministry, especially before significant events like the start of his ministry or preceding his death, Jesus spent long times in prayer, in solitude, in silence. And this kept Jesus, the Son of God, intimately connected to his Father. They had a deep, life-giving relationship, and Jesus expressed his dependence on his Father for guidance and power in his life. When was the last time you spent with God in prayer? expressing your dependence on him, developing a relationship and seeking God's guidance. We need to find the activities that help us learn how to be with God instead of just do things for God. What are you going to do to prioritize your relationship with God? How are you going to write God into your daily schedule and weekly schedule first instead of last? Is it a Bible reading plan, specific times and places to pray, time to just rest in God's presence and silence and solitude, worshiping to some recorded worship music? I don't know what it is for you, but everyone in person was given a little handout when you came in. And if you're joining us online, you can download it or access it online as well on the Bible app, on the YouTube stream, or in Church Center. The first quadrant of your handout is marked with a G. And as I ta talk and as you reflect today, make a few notes on how you might structure your time so you follow Jesus' lead in spending time with God first instead of last. God is the source of all love and life, and the path to more love, to more life, isn't everything in everyone else. It's time with God. That's the first thing that Jesus calls us to do. The next priority must be people. When Jesus was asked what the most important commandment was, what the core of following him and his way was about, he answered like this. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Jesus said, it's all about loving God and loving people. He even went so far as to say that loving people is of equal importance to loving God. And this seems like a bold claim, but it reveals that loving people is one of the clearest ways to demonstrate that we love God. People 
are the center of God's heartbeat. And if we love God, our heart should begin to love what God loves. And God is head over heels for you. The psalmist expresses it this way in Psalm 139. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous how well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, O God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. Not only did God form you intimately and knows everything about you, Jesus even declared that his followers would be known by their love. He said, your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. So how are you prioritizing people, especially those who are most important to you? Are you present with them when you talk, when you share a meal, when you spend time together? Or are you focused on your phone or everything else that is distracting you from real life? I want my family and friends, my wife, my sons and daughter to know that they matter to me far more than my work or my hobbies or my phone or the minutia of life that is always clamoring for attention. One of the great things about my father is that when I call him, even in the middle of the workday, he answers his phone. Even if he tells me he needs to call back, he shows that I matter to him by making time to talk. I want to do that for my children for my wife. I want to create moments of magic and wonder. I want to craft a life that is worth looking up to and points them to the author and perfecter of my faith, Jesus Christ. When I get to the end of my life, I don't want people to remember me as being too busy for them. I want to create space for what matters most and leave space for those I haven't met yet. So let's show others that we love them by paying attention and really listening to them, by giving them time in our schedules, by being truly present with them. So look at the second quadrant with the P up top. Maybe jot a few things down, some non-negotiables. How will I make sure that people are prioritized in my daily schedule? The third ball also has a P, representing purpose. Each of us was created especially by God with certain gifts and interests and passions. You were made to join God in his mission of loving our world back to wholeness, and he's entrusted you with a unique part of that mission. The great missionary church planner Paul says it this way in Ephesians 2.10, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. We have been made for a good and beautiful purpose. We are his masterpiece. So what are you doing to not only discover your role, but to develop the gifts that you have and to live into that purpose that God has created you for? Jesus spent time with God. He cared for people radically and he invested in a small group specifically while also having a clear purpose that he wasn't going to get sidetracked from, even by good things. He wasn't hurried or neglectful of relationships as he did the good and beautiful work that God called him to. But as he was moving to his arrest, he prayed in John 17, 4, that he had completed the work that God gave him to do. And we have a role to play as well, not as the main character or the hero of the grand story, but as people who are invited to join Jesus' kingdom and to work as a representative of God's great love. In Matthew 25, Jesus tells a story about a master who leaves on a long trip and entrusts his servants with different amounts of silver called talents. He gives five talents to one who takes it and doubles it with his investments. The next receives two talents and also doubles the money. The last receives only one talent, but he takes it and buries it in the ground rather than risk losing it. When the master returns, he praises the two servants who doubled his money. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. So the first two servants doubled the money, but when he discovered that the last servant did nothing with what he was entrusted, not even depositing it in the bank to gain interest, the master is furious. But his master answered him, you wicked and slothful servant. 
and then he banishes the servant from sight. When we don't use and develop the gifts, interests, and passions, when we don't learn from our experiences and use them to minister to others and to join God's mission in the world, we haven't just missed our chance to fulfill our purpose and live a fulfilled, joyful life. Jesus says that in this instance, we're wicked and lazy. I know what I want my master to say when, I, when he returns. I want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. So what are you going to do? How are you going to make space in your life to make sure that you're living out the purpose God placed you on this earth for? Purpose, P, is the third quadrant. So consider, how are you going to make space in your life for the good work that God has entrusted to you? Then the final priority we have to make sure that we are structuring our time well and structuring our time after the way of Jesus is Sabbath. We are made for a healthy rhythm of work and rest, and it's woven into creation from the very beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Everything was made to join the love that the Father, Son, and Spirit have shared for all eternity. And the creation story is a story of order and rhythm. There were six days of creation, of good and beautiful work in which our world and universe was made. And then there was rest. So the creation of the heavens and the earth and everything in them was completed. On the seventh day, God had finished his work of creation, so he rested from all his work. And God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy, because it was the day when he rested from all his work of creation. So our three-in-one God, maker of all that exists, did hard, creative, incredible work for six days, and then rested. God rested. And it's not just in the rhythms of creation, it's in the Ten Commandments. In fact, it's the longest of the Ten. Almost a third of the text of the Ten Commandments is about Sabbath. We're to make one day out of seven holy or set apart, different from every other day. Everyone is supposed to stop from work for a full 24 hours and dedicate that day to God. And we don't just stop and do nothing. We stop work and we worship and we rest and we delight. We enjoy the lives that God has blessed us with, the people we love to be around, the things we love to do that fill our souls with joy, and we connect with the God who gave us life. And it's not just in the Ten Commandments, it is the most often repeated commandment in the Bible. More than don't murder or don't lie or love others, it's to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And Jesus continued that pattern in his ministry. Jesus did ministry for three years with the most important and world-altering purpose ever, but he still rested. No matter how important you may be or your purpose is, you are not a human working, you are a human being, and you're made for a healthy rhythm of work and rest. God rested at creation. Jesus rested every week in his ministry, and we are called and invited into a healthy rhythm of work and rest as well. And this is exemplified by the practice of Sabbath. If we want to model our lives after his, we need to practice Sabbath as well. We stop from our good and purposeful work. We rest in God's love, trusting in his care for us and our world and restoring our bodies and souls. We delight in the good gifts and people that God has blessed us with. And we worship our God who is the giver of every good gift and the source of all love and life. Author Andy Crouch encourages us this way. We think of Sabbath as a day, but in fact, Sabbath was not just a day, but an organizing principle for the Jewish people. It was a pattern of life that extended to the Sabbath year. One year, every seven where fields lay fallow and the people were commanded to rest and worship. And to the Jubilee year, one year, every 49 where debts were forgiven and indentured servants were freed. For us too, Sabbath will be most powerful and helpful if we let its core pattern of work and rest become the defining pattern of our lives. Crouch encourages us to think of a pattern of one hour a day, one day a week, one week a year, to stop, rest, delight, and worship. So as you look at the quadrants you have, what can you do to follow Jesus in this area, to practice Sabbath, one hour a day, one day a week? one week a year and begin to align your heart with the way of Jesus more and more. So how do we make sure that we structure our time in a way that helps us seek the kingdom of God first and become who God designed us to be? To craft a worth, 
a life worth living. It's G-P-P-S. G-P-P-S. God, people, purpose, Sabbath. God, people, purpose, Sabbath. Our lives are full of things we have to do. Our pictures are full of sand. And if we aren't careful, there's not room for what matters most, for G-P-P-S. It seems so easy to fix. It's such a small problem, but this may be the greatest spiritual challenge we face. It's not the open defiance of our lives that is keeping us from the kingdom of God. It's that we have allowed the rhythm of the world to shape our lives instead of the rhythms of God. And what matters most has been replaced by tasks and to-dos and urgent busyness, or by distraction, laziness, and disconnection. Ortberg warns us this way, the danger is that you will lead a respectable, decent, non-scandalous, busy, tired, human-powered life that is unspeakably sad. We want to seek the kingdom of God first, but we are just so busy. We're waiting for the right time. And if we aren't careful, what we'll be left with is regret. And here's the thing with regret. Regret for what we've done, for our bad decisions, will reduce over time. But regret for what we didn't do, that sort of regret haunts us. And according to Jesus' brother James, what we don't do will imperil our souls. Remember, it is a sin to know what you ought to do and then not to do it. The jar isn't getting any bigger. We won't get more than 24 hours. As Job says, a man's days are numbered. You know the number of his months. He cannot live longer than the time you have set. Whether we're too busy or looking ahead to a day that is yet to arrive, we are missing out on the life we were intended to lead. We need to be people who follow Jesus, who live after his pattern, who are the people of the way as Jesus' followers early on were known. We need to be people who seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and trust that he will give you everything that you need. So how can we do this? We must empty everything out of our life, dump all the sand out, and put the balls in first. We need to choose loving God and loving others, fulfilling our purpose and Sabbathing first. We set those in our schedule first, and then we let everything else trickle around it. The tasks we have to do, the work we have to do, all of these other things, they filter around what we've decided and structured our lives for first. We may not get everything done, but we will trust Jesus when he says that we will, when we follow his pattern, his rhythm, when we prioritize what truly matters, we will be given everything we need. Okay. I may not be able to do everything that I want, but I will always be able to do everything God wants me to do. We will always have enough time for what God has truly called us to. So practically, how do we make our lives into this, where we have prioritized what really matters? We need to specifically schedule the most important things in our lives first. So look at your chart and then compare it to your schedule. How will you prioritize God, people, purpose, Sabbath? It may be helpful to you to consider what are you doing now and where is your time going? This doesn't mean you just sleep less, which is a classic American thing. We are rarely healthy or loving when we are tired but it's how do I structure my time differently to prioritize what matters most as I craft my life. And maybe you're doing pretty well in this area. Maybe you're not doing well at all, but the only way to know is to track your time and figure out where it's going. And don't forget to check your digital well-being app if you're on Android or screen time app if you use Apple and discover how much time you're using on your devices. There is a good chance you're probably underestimating your usage. It will even tell you which apps and activities you're giving too much time to, and you can limit them right on your phone with your pursuit of the kingdom of God as your priority of G-P-P-S. From there, it's time to make changes in a way that will honor God, the people that you love, the purpose that you're to steward, and the rhythm of Sabbath that is sustainable for you. So you let some things go, you pick up some other things, you begin to work towards a new rhythm of life. And as you do this, you invite others into the process who can help you grow and you rely on God's spirit to help you change. The Holy Spirit is who produces 
the life of Jesus in you, and it is not a magical process. It happens when you partner with God and spend time with Jesus first. From our connection with God comes the fruit of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. In the last year and a half, I've attended more funerals than any other period of my life. And each of these funerals is not only a celebration of life, but it's an opportunity to mourn well, as well as to remember that one day, a day that I can't predict, my earthly life will end. And at my funeral, I hope that those who remember me can honestly say that I loved God and loved people, can joyously reflect on my life and say that I completed the work and purpose God gave me and I lived in rhythm with the way of Jesus. I hope that it will be clear that I have crafted a life that is centered on Jesus and the kingdom of God. But that day and that funeral won't be the end. Our real life, far from being over, is really just begun. C.S. Lewis says it this way in The Last Battle. All their life in this world and all their adventures had only been the cover and the title page. Now at last they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter is better than the one before. The promise of Jesus is that his death and resurrection has conquered sin, evil, and death, and that life with Jesus continues into eternity where all that is wrong is put back to the way it was meant to be, and we will share the love of God and each other forever. So until that day comes, may we craft a life around what matters. And I pray on that last day, we will all hear, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we admit that that there's so much clamming for our time, that it's so easy to fill our day with the urgent tasks, with the things that need to get done and to begin neglecting what really matters. It's so easy to let distraction fill our days, to keep doom scrolling on social media, to play that game one more time, to just watch other people's lives instead of living our own. Lord, help us to release the things that are keeping us from pursuing your kingdom first. Help us to prioritize time with you time with other people, the purpose that you've given each of us and the Sabbath rhythm you've called us to practice. May we live more and more in line with the life of Jesus and discover the life that is truly life as we do it. Through the power of Jesus, in his holy name I pray, amen. Thank you for joining the Damascus Road Podcast. Our mission is to follow Jesus together by being with God, loving everyone, transforming people, developing leaders, growing new ministries, and changing the world. You can find out more about us online at DamascusRoadTucson.com.